Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. Um, this is an interesting episode uh, in the sense of how it got pulled together. So normally when people get on the show, it's usually one of two ways. Either they got my attention or, you know, sometimes, you know, certain companies, they don't have a lot of traction. Not a lot of people know them, including myself. And, and they come and they want to sponsor an episode, which is perfectly fine. So it's usually rare that somebody pitches me, right? and pitches me cold and I just say, yeah, you know, I should have this on. So uh, I got an email uh, from the founder and CEO of this company called Future Cardia and his name is Jason Bang. And the subject line said, why Combinator Dropout raises $11 million, implantable cardiac monitor. So first of all, shout out to you, Jay, for such a great subject line. So that got my attention. I opened the email and says this, Hey, Omar, hope this email finds you well. I saw your podcast and wanted to reach out. My name is Jay Bang from Tampa, Florida, X Metronic, CVRX, EBR Systems. We've raised over $11 million without venture capital money. Uh, we also have J&J &J Lab, Stanford StartX, and YCS 2021, which he dropped out of. We have a patient implant scheduled for November of this year. We've raised a total of $8 million via equity crowdfunding and $3 million raised from Mr. Larry Lawson, who, if you guys don't know who that is, is a very well-known um, uh, 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 investor. And also, they raised from Santa Angels and others. Um, and would you be open to a short Zoom intro? I I'd, would welcome an opportunity to talk to you, talk with you on our podcast. And so I like that because he didn't. He wants to. He wanted to come on my show, but first he wanted to talk to me on Zoom, and you know vet his case out. So we had a conversation. I loved what I heard. I thought it was a really interesting device, especially considering how they raise money. And so this episode, um, we talk with Jay Bang, who uh, is tackling cardiac arrhythmia and heart failure, um, which is one of the biggest problems in healthcare um, in a very, very competitive space. But they have a very unique device and very interesting model. So uh, in this episode, we cover that. And before we jump in, we want to cover, of course, just a few of our uh, wonderful sponsors, but also like some offers we have. So first of all, if you are a sales rep or a sales manager, maybe even a founder, and you're trying to discover uh, which early adopters are best for your product, you know, it could be a really difficult job. The other side of it is that using databases uh, can be really expensive. Well, that's why I partnered with a company called Alpha Sophia. Alpha Sophia is a, a SaaS company that focuses on gathering all the data around prescribing behavior, procedure volume, societies, even social media, and allowing you to search in a very simple, easy to use platform, the surgeons, so you can figure out who you should target. Again, uh, they bring in great metrics such as their procedure volume, the societies they're in. They even loop in which social media handles they have. So that way you can even look on the digital side of influence. And so they're doing a special uh, special offer for my audience where you can get three free profiles done for you. Um, all you got to do is out, go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar. That's A-L-P-H-A-S-O-P-H-I-A dot com forward slash Omar. You get free uh, three free profiles. So even if you're a rep or associate, go ahead and take them up on it. And the best part is that if you want to use our platform, it is so affordable. The problem with a lot of the databases that are out there and, and, and softwares like this is that they usually cost a lot of money, like thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year and more. Their platform starts at three hundred dollars a month. So this is great news, especially for startup founders, which is what um, Paul Lucas Hoffman, their CEO and founder, said he was most interested in, which is providing this kind of information and, and this tool 
to early stage companies, right? So go to alphasofia.com forward slash Omar to learn more. And then lastly, if you are a sales rep, you're ready to level up your game and learn how to sell at scale and take your career to the next level, I want you to join my medical sales network effects program. It's a fantastic program where you get on-demand content that you can go through at your own pace to teach you how to use LinkedIn to sell at scale, to market, to grow your territory, but also how to use other areas of your toolbox, such as email persuasion, video sales letters, and more. We have a private community full of VP CEOs and other reps, plus we do weekly coaching calls, so you can get closer to me and ask me questions anytime you want. My goal for the people in this program is to get closer to, to them and, more importantly, help them with their careers, whether they're CEOs and founders or sales reps trying to go to the next level. So to do that, check the show notes below. I have a special link just for you with a huge discount so you can enroll in the course today. So with that being said, let's get on to our episode with Jay Bang, founder and CEO of Future Cardia. Enjoy. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. Um, another really interesting episode, and I got to give a little bit of an intro to this. You know, for, for the state of MedTech, again, I'm, I'm very grateful to our audience because you guys helped us become the number one show in MedTech. And as a result of that, um, we get a lot of inbound. There's more inbound requests to come on the show than I can handle. And so getting even my attention is really hard. Um, and uh, usually I don't I don't uh, respond very quickly to people who are just who are trying to get on the show show themselves. But I'll say our guest today had such a compelling story um, and, and more importantly, a very interesting product that I said, yeah, I absolutely this is exactly the kind of uh, technology I want to have on the show. So for Every, I don't know, 50 or 100 uh, emails I get, usually there's like one that stands out where I'm like really interesting founding founder, really cool technology. And so I'm very happy to introduce Jay Bang, who's the founder of Future Cardia. But before we jump into it, Jay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I got to read the email that you sent me because, again, I thought it was so well done. So first, subject line is why Combinator Dropout raises $11 million implantable cardiac monitor. So already that got my attention. I'm like, all right, so this guy's a YC, YC alum, but dropped out. Okay, so I opened the email and says, hello, Omar, hope this email finds you well. I saw your podcast and wanted to reach out. My name is Jay Bang from Tampa, Florida, Xmetronic, CVRX, Eber system. We raised over 11 million without VCs. Okay, J and J, J Lab, Stanford, StartX, YCS uh, 2021, but dropped out. Patient implant scheduled for tw November 2023, raised a total of $8 million via equity crowdfunding, $3 million raised from Larry Lawson at Sand Hill Angels and others. Would you be open to an intro Zoom? I'd welcome the opportunity to talk to you on your podcast. And then you shared a picture of you and your team uh, uh, showing off the device. First of all, yeah. um, thank you for sending a great email because a lot of people send me these emails with like, documents and all these, and I don't have time to read all this. Your email was to the point. It highlighted exactly what you guys are, who you are, what you do, but more importantly, why, why it would be interesting to have you on the show. So first, so just shout out, I got to give you credit there, but um, let's okay. talk about this amazing technology that you have um, in a very competitive market. So uh, first of all, maybe for the audience that's, that doesn't know you, maybe a quick intro in terms of your background, because you're a med tech veteran. So I, if you kind of give a little bit about your background, we'll, we'll jump into the company shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. And thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So I started my career in the um, medical devices sales with Medtronic and it did that for five years. I loved it. It was like my dream, dream job. And then I uh, got introduced to the uh, startup world where you know, just things were even more interesting. Uh, and I always wanted to go something smaller, more intimate, more crazier. So CVRX was my first foray into the uh, startup world. And at that time, I guess this was um, 20, 2010. So CVRX was one of the biggest uh, startup at that time, heavily funded, uh, JJDC, New Enterprise Associates, strong board, strong leadership, so I, I learned a lot, you know, I, I was a field operator. And from that experience, I learned regulatory, I learned engineering, I learned uh, including, you know, like C-suite operations. So that really opened my eyes into the startup world. And then I went to Abiomed and then to another startup called EBR Systems with the legendary uh, founders and entrepreneurs that led that company. So yeah, so that was, that's my thing. All my career, almost 20 years, 
everything's been implantable cardiac devices or some type of neuromodulations. That's fantastic. And I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's great to hear that because usually when people, one of two things happen when somebody leaves a place like, let's say, Medtronic or JJ and goes into a startup, either A, they go running back because, you know, being in a startup, you have to have pretty thick skin and you have to be able to go to sleep when multiple fires are going around. Or it's a one way street where you get you, you, you take that one way street and you're like, oh, my God, why didn't I do this sooner? And it sounds like, you know, you're definitely a startup guy. And that's for me. I don't know anything else in my in, in, in the world because that's been my entire career. So I'm really happy to hear that. Um, so let's talk about the device. So you guys folks specifically focus on cardiac arrhythmias which and heart failure, which is a huge, huge problem, especially here in the United States. Um, let's start with the inception of the device. I know that's your background, but how did the inception of the device come about? Yeah, so when I was at Medtronic, the biventricular pacing or biventricular defibrillation was just about to st starting already. And it was a really, really complex case. You know, it was common for us to do six, eight hour surgeries. Nowadays, it's usually done under an hour. But at that time, you know, six hour case was the norm. So I knew there was a huge problem with these patients. And even after we implant these devices, they were struggling. You know, we go, the patients go through this tremendous procedure, traumatic procedure, and then we basically give them a you know, plastic bag and say, go home and you figure it out, that kind of situation. And with CVRX, you know, another incredible technology, same problem, you know, just go through this traumatic surgeries, open neck kind of, you know, surgeries to treat these patients. Again, you know, you're, you're on your own at home kind of situation. And same thing with, you know, all uh, uh, heart failure patients are going through the same thing. So I wanted to come up with a solution that makes sense. And in 20 years, this hasn't been solved. You know, patients are stuck between, am I sick enough to go to the hospital or am I well enough to wait it out? That's a constant problem. And they call the doctor and they can't accommodate this patient. So, well, if you think he's sick, go to the ER. If you don't think he's that sick, come and see us next week, that kind of problem. So I wanted to come up with a solution that would make sense for patients outside of the hospital at their home. Yeah, and uh, what I what I like about this device, and Ian, again, it's implantable, goes under the skin. What's interesting about it is it addresses sort of, I don't want to call it a problem, but, but like the main thing we came out of 2020 with is that patients want to find ways to be treated either at home, and if not at home, like at a small, you know, outpatient facility. I just had uh, Jeff Alvarez, who's the chief strategy officer over, over at Moon, they have a robotics uh, system. And we talked about the same thing, which is like, even for me, when I think about, uh, let's say going to a doctor's appointment, or if I, if I had to, God forbid, have a procedure done, the idea, as much as I love, you know, scripts or UCSF or UCLA or these huge, the idea of going to these massive gargantuan hospital systems and like, to get treated, like, it's a huge turnoff. And so I think more people want this option to be treated as close to, if not from their home as possible. It sounds like that's one of the main problems you guys are addressing. Is that correct? Absolutely. And these are patients with chronic diseases, so they cannot go to the hospital or clinic every day or every week. So we have to have some kind of solution for them that they can manage to a certain degree at their home. And this is no different than managing your own diabetes or managing your own medications, right? So you don't go to the pharmacy every day to pick up your pills. You have set of medications that you administer yourself and you manage it, right? And same thing with diabetic patients. You manage your glucose, you draw the medicine yourself, you in inject the medication yourself. So these are something that our patients have been doing it for a very long time and doing it very well. So we should be able to do the same thing for heart failure patients who are in you know, a bigger, uh, pro they're facing even bigger problem than these patients. Got it. So uh, maybe we can talk more specifically about the problem. Like, so can you give us, can I walk, walk me through, if I'm a patient, let's say with a specific cardiac arrhythmia, or let's say heart failure, um, what are the next steps in terms of how the product, is the product called Future Car Cardio or is the product a separate name? Yeah, the product is called Vision. Uh, and the company name is Future Cardio. So- Got it. Uh, Best ways to measure heart cardiac performance right now is ECG and heart sounds. So why don't we use ECG and heart sounds to assess heart? So that's our approach. Um, a lot of the companies are using uh, fluid monitoring or uh, visualization, all these 
in, you know, technologies that are maybe two, three, four steps away from the heart. So our goal is to just measure the heart directly from the heart with the heart sounds and ECG. Give us the electrical aspect of the heart and mechanical as aspect of the heart. So that will give us the, the raw data from the patients. And instead of just measuring it once in a while, we'll measure it consistently for long period of time. So we get a trending data. So uh, especially with heart failure patients, you could have one marker that's higher, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're really sick. Or you could have one marker that's really low, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing well. So we got these multiple factors on these patients, and you can't just put all these patients into one group and have a one index and say, anything above this is bad, anything above, below this is good. It just doesn't work in heart failure. So our goal is to get the data directly from the source and monitor trending data over a long period of time. Got it. Currently, I mean, uh... Because, you know, when, it, when you think about like remote monitoring, there's a lot of solutions for different diseases and everything. I would imagine that for like heart and cardiac failure, there are some competitive products. Like what, what, what's the bigger, dif bigger difference between what's out there and let's say what, what Future Cardia has? Sure, sure. So right now there's two viable options for the patients. Uh, wearables are ideal for short term. So if you need something checked for one to two weeks, perfect. Just put that on. It would be a perfect solution for that patient. And if that doesn't work, I would, I would argue, say, do it one more time. Do it three more times if you can. That would be ideal for that patient population. On the other hand, we've got the uh, cardio maps, which is very, very accurate. But this requires a cath lab procedure in a, in a cardiac cath lab. So it, from a patient's and physician's perspective, you have two choices now. You have something that is not all that helpful for you, the wearables or something that is too invasive for a, a, a monitoring solution. So they're, they're all, again, stuck between sick enough to go to the ER, well in, enough to wait it out, or uh, something that is not that helpful versus something that is too invasive. So there's a, like this middle, middle ground that, uh, that the patients and the clinicians are in need of. And Medtronic is aware of that, and so is Boston Scientific. So right now, there's only three companies, Medtronic, Boston, and future cardiac that are going after that under the skin office-based implant procedure. Got it. Well, you know, those are, those are two really big names and really competitive ones. So, I mean, how, how does a company like future cardiac compete with the likes of a Boston scientific or Medtronic? Right, right. So technology, we're going to, we're going to beat them with technology. So we won't beat them with uh, size. We don't have that kind of budget. So we're taking advantage of, rapidly changing sensor technology. So imagine a company, big companies, they have a fr design freeze five years ago. So whatever you, the device you're getting right now is five years old. Whereas in our case, we're getting the latest and the fastest chip that's out there. And we can iterate every six months, every one year as the chip design changes, which the big companies cannot. So just on that aspect, we have a superior technology just because of our ability to move faster and more agile. Got it. And also on and, the, go ahead. And I was going to say, while, while we're talking, just because this is the benefit of this platform, I'm going to bring up the, uh, the device right now, just on, uh, from your website. Sorry, continue what you're saying. Yeah. And also market penetration. So we don't have the burden of going after every single implanter in the country, like those big companies do. And on top of that, there are big underserved markets that the uh, these big companies just are not going into. So we're going to focus on underserved markets and high volume markets as well. And there's a huge gap. Again, uh, these are uh, markets that it just overlooked by these big companies. And sometimes it's just not worth the investment going to those uh, territories for them. But for us, we can get in literally next day. Got it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, I think a very fair answer because, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think this is the big thing about, um, you know, compared to let's say the SaaS industry or social media, or everything in our industry, um, design freezes happen, you know, it's very difficult to take a medical device to market. And so when you're at a large company, I mean, this is as for me as a market is why I never wanted to go work for a J and J or Medtronic is because like, you know, marketing itself is changing so fast, like to get something approved and go through like, 
it's already too late. And especially these days, I mean, I think Moore's law is, still, is very much alive and well. And so sensor technology is improving. Like I think every six to nine months, there's better and, and more improved sensor technology, but at these larger companies, it's just really hard to move. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And, and the improvement, it, I, literally six to nine months and these devices are uh, getting faster and more efficient and size wise they can't get any smaller so size they already achieved it how, but how big how big is is vision the your product our our device is smaller than the older version so this is the older Medtronic this is about 15 20 years old and this is a um, our our current device and certainly bigger than the what's out in the market. So the beauty of this size is that it has no compromise to the patients and implant time. So matter of fact, the implant time takes exactly the same for all these three devices. And the the performance is about the same. So the beauty that our device bring is that we lower the cost of manufacturing that as the device gets smaller and smaller it gets, gets more expensive and more finicky so we have this uh, uh what i call a land cruiser approach something that works beautifully all the time instead of a formula one approach that yeah it's fast only under certain condition on a certain day and a certain time so ours is a uh that's our approach land cruiser approach Got it. And, you know, let's talk about the procedure. So I have this up again from your, um, this is your start engine uh, uh, site. So talk, walk us through the actual procedure in terms of like a patient goes in to get this put in. It looks like a, like, like it looks like this can be done in an outpatient setting with like local anesthesia. Is that, am I right? It looks pretty simple. Absolutely. And this is the same procedure that's being done with Medtronic devices and the Abbott and the uh, Boston Scientific devices. So, so this is literally first... just a subdermal. This is just a subdermal dermal device. Yeah, subcutaneous, and all Sub the implants, all, all electrophysiologists know how to implant this. So this was important for us because uh, coming from a um, startup world, I realized the cost of physician training is massive, and not because I mean they already know how to do it, but we have to be there to train them the proper way to implant something that they haven't done before. So it's not an issue of expertise, it's an issue of familiarity. And as a startup company, uh, so physician has all these different procedures they have to do, and they got this one little unique device, they just did it a month ago. And then a month later, uh, obviously you gotta go back again to refresh this uh, training. So no matter how simple it is, we have to be there every procedure, sometimes two, three of us has to be there. So the cost of this service was so high, I, I needed to come up with a solution that they already knew how to do. And this was an ideal situation. You know, so something, so once, once it's been implanted, so again, subcutaneous, it seems like a very simple procedure. And again, it's, so for people who are listening, it's not something that goes into the heart, it just goes under the skin, right? Close under to the, the heart. Okay. And so it's it's it starts sensing what exactly is it sensing and what is it picking up and then where's where, where does that information go yeah so it has a one end think of it like a positive and negative on the other on each end so it records ecg the single lead ecg no different than any other single lead ecgs that are implanted under the skin but it also has an acoustic sensor that senses vibration and movement and body posture so it records that vi uh, vibration, which is the heart sounds, and convert that um, that vibration and convert that into a heart sounds. So think of it like a digital stethoscope on steroids. That's that's actually a really good way to put it too. I guess you know maybe you know you mentioned digital stethoscopes. So one of the one of the companies I really like a lot is Echo. Echo has a smart stethoscope, um, which in my mind it it essentially um, you know it's not for cardiologists. Cardiologist may probably does not need an echo, uh, echo the, the product that is, um, mm -hmm. or smart stuff to go, but like a primary care doctor, you know, that you've taken the, the expertise of a specialist and put it at scale with primary care, you know, for, for, for future cardias product, do you feel like, um, once it's implanted in the patient, this is something that I saw on your website that, you know, it, the data can go into the patient's phone so they can see it, but also that data is going to go to a clinician. Would that go to their primary care, their cardiologist? What, what does that look like? 
Yeah, actually, that is probably the biggest puzzle in this industry as a whole. You, you give a great tool to a patient, but there's nobody on the other end that's going to read it for you. So uh, with in, implantable devices, we have that infrastructure already built out. So the, the device, the, the data from the phone goes to the phone, phone sends up the data up to the cloud, and the physician or the clinician access that data remotely from the web portal. So this happens with defibrillators, pacemakers, uh, uh, implantable cardiac monitors like ours. So this uh, path has already been paved for the patients and physicians. So the data is already sitting at the uh, physician's desk and they will review it sometime this today or tomorrow and act on that uh, later this week. So there's about, you know, I would say there's about a four or five day a grace period in which the physician can act on this. Whereas if it's a wearable and you, you you feel something bad right now and you put it on, and then what? There's nobody on the other side that's going to read it for you. So that's that's where the uh, problem comes in with a, a acute um, monitoring device. Um, the, the, the course of patient's uh, decision-making does not change. So if you think you're in an emergency, you don't put a device on top of your chest and wait for somebody to call you or wait for something to tell you. You're going to call 911 and do it. So nothing changes. And this device, uh, um, the, the, this type of wearable devices doesn't really solve that problem for the patients. Got it. You know, and, you know, uh, security is like a big, big thing here. So when that data is being transmitted, is that being transmitted into an existing uh, platform for, for clinicians? Is it something unique to you guys? Where, where does that data go? Yeah, that's another big, big issue, the HIPAA compliant data transfer. So all our data is HIPAA compliant. It's storaged in a HIPAA compliant uh, cloud solution called Galen, Galen Data. So Amazon- Oh is yeah, I know, I know Galen. Galen's a, yeah. it's a great platform. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great company. Uh, completely turnkey op operations is, you know, uh, the data goes there, it's completely secured uh, and HIPAA compliant. And that also allowed us to move faster, uh, that we didn't have to create a HIPAA compliant data storage. And that is available for all of us now. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, the, not, I want to say the most important thing, but you know, you are a startup, you're raising money and everything. So let's, let's talk about the money side. So again, um, I know that you've, 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 you've used a variety of investment vehicles from equity crowdfunding to angels. Uh, I really like that a lot. Personally, I think, you know, the, the more I I've been involved with equity crowdfunding, I feel like most startups, even if they're not doing equity crowdfunding, they should design and think about it that way. Because like, you know, the nice thing about equity crowdfunding is that it forces you to put all the information down in a very simple and easy to read manner. And so for me, like that was the other reason why it was very easy for me to have you on my shows. Cause I went to your equity crowdfunding page. It describes everything very clear. So one of the things that I really like, so for me, I've worked at a lot of disruptive, you know, any insurance coverage, any reimbursement code, nothing. Right. So you, right. you, you highlight that you guys actually have a very short regulatory pathway. So I'm guessing you did it. You did this through five, 10 K correct. Yes, and, and it okay. helped that we have a predicate device. So the old Medtronic Reveal is the predicate mm -hmm. they were following. And then the next generation of Medtronic Link is another predicate they were following. And they all have a 510K uh, designation and existing reimbursement. So as long as we yeah. follow the same path, we are uh, on the same category. So you're, you know, at least on the, on the um, business model side, what you guys are trying to do is take advantage of, let's say, existing and affordable battery solutions. So I'm looking at, at your guys' site. So $1,000 cost to manufacture, $5,300 unit price, and then $7,400 for, uh, for established reimbursement. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And 1000 is because we're hand uh, building these devices. So as Where are you hand building them? Uh, a resolution medical in Minnesota. So that's for us, you know, Minnesota is the uh, mecca of uh, implanting devices. Let, let me ask you kind of a controversial question. Um, so I'm very big on American manufacturing. I, I, I love hearing American made products. Why, uh, why build here in America when you can obviously get it much cheaper overseas, you know? Yeah, we had that option too. We looked at it. We looked at India, Have a they have a good pacemaker company there. China also manufacturing some pacemakers there. 
uh, cost to us was not the number one reason. I, I wanted um, uh, control of the quality. And we have our, our team in Minnesota, Minneapolis. So it was easier for us to go there personally and see the operation. And, and Resolution has been a great partner. We are allowed to come into their facility and and work with them at the same time. So that was big for us. So if this was in China, yes, it would be cheaper, but my team would have had to fly there twice a month, right? So it still would have been cheaper. That's the thing, that's the thing. Yeah. you know, what's funny is that, that I think that's the thing that people don't account for, which is like, if you go overseas, yes, you'll save, you'll save money, but then the time and cost it takes for managing that process and everything. It's, it's very brutal. It's grueling, you know? Brutal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So imagine, you know, let's say we go to, we have a great Chinese partner. Let's say we go there. So one day to get there and then you have at least one day to recover and then you do three days of work, come back and two weeks later, you got to do that again. So um, that wasn't going to work uh, unless we have somebody in China. And the, the key thing for me was control of quality control and our ability to uh, make fast changes. And with partners in in US, uh, like EI Micro, which is just down this uh, maybe hour and a half away from Minneapolis, uh, uh, Minas Minneapolis, um, they delivered it for us. You know, also oh, the shipping didn't come through, so the the staff got in the car and drove it and delivered it, hand delivered a product for us. So those kind of uh, uh, pride in work and collaboration is something that we won't have overseas. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting that you thought of it like that too. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, um, you know, I always find it to be interesting, uh, because, you know, at least in our industry, a lot of times people who go to, so if you look in the tech industry, a lot of the founders are usually like, like fresh out of college and everything. So they make all kinds of mistakes, but at least in our industry, it's usually, you know, like you worked in Medtronic, you, you, you know, the costs of these things. And so making that kind of decision, which is more of a long-term decision versus a short term is just like, it's easier to be like, Hey, let's just do this overseas. We're going to save a lot of money, but then you don't, right. you don't account for the sort of the long-term impacts of those things. Um, right. And, and the, the, one more thing. There's, oh yeah. Go for so it. One, yeah. One thing that really bothered me when I was at big companies is the, this mentality of pump and layoff, you know, that mm. always bothered me. So I remember, you know, everybody's working together, the entire company trying to meet the numbers and manufacturing is working overtime, triple overtime, getting it all done. And we beat the numbers and like within a week, they lay off all the manufacturing people. And to me, it just made no sense. And so uh, even though we're a startup, uh, we're very scrappy and resourceful, but to me that having that, honor amongst uh, renegades kind of uh, mentality, you know, we stick together, we'll build together. To me, that was important. I, I, I like that honor amongst re renegades, but yeah, no, a hundred, a hundred percent. And again, like, I think, you know, I have not, uh, I've worked in venture back companies. I've helped, you know, with, with raises and stuff. I've never, you know, founded one, but I feel like, um, again, on paper, some of these decisions make sense, but there, there are some things that you don't account for. So, okay, uh, you, you, if you do that pump, pump and lay off, there's, there's a transition period where like that's costly, both time and money wise, and you don't know what that's going to be like, you know, yeah, cost more money. And of course, we need to build it again. So we hire back those people, and half of them are gone. The people that were fully trained, and the other half are not happy because they, they did all this work and sacrifice for the company, and then they're you know, got laid off for six months and come back. And yeah, so those are kind of things that I, I can empathize with the CEOs and the uh, C-suite executives and why, why they needs to be done. But it, uh, I like to think of it more of a long-term solution rather than meet the numbers for this quarter. A hundred percent. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit, your, your go-to-market strategy is very interesting, specifically in terms of why you're deciding to focus on a couple of key states. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So implantable operations are not widely uh, utilized. So some, some areas do more than others. Um, and another example is if you go to like really expensive city, let's say 
I'm just throwing it out. Let's say New York, Manhattan, great doctors, great patients, great everything. But cost of operation there is astronomical. So even simple things like putting an EKG sticker on our patients. So we want to control everything. So we go there, provide this service to the physician and the patients. So we did all this, put this crazy numbers of stickers on their patients. And then it comes off. So we got to stay there for another day. And we put it back on. We make sure the patient's not going all over the place. So we put patients in Manhattan also. So we, we try to control all this so we can get, have a good outcome for the patients. And before you know it, one trip is costing 10 grand, right? For you, your team, and the patients. And you may not get the results that you want. So having everything uh, in one region is the key. So yeah, I will lose out on big cities like New York City. I will lose out on Chicago. I'll lose out on San Francisco, maybe LA, but I'll win by providing a service to patients and physicians in a local area. So let's say my guy is in, in Houston and something needs to be done in Dallas right now. Just drive there and get it done. There's no airplane, no um, planning this, planning that. Just drive there and get it done. And that's how we did it at Medtronic. We cover entire two or three counties between nine of us, we just drive and get it done. And having well, that- When you say drive and get it done, what does that mean? Oh, driving and see the patient that needs uh, to be uh, uh, monitored or helped or physician that needs uh, some kind of troubleshooting with the device. Uh, this is something that I'm, that's sort of new to me because I haven't worked personally in the cardiac space. And so it sounds like, I mean, when, a pay, when there's an issue with the device or something comes up, like you have a clinical specialist from the company, not the physician. Why, right. what is it? What does that normally look like? What, what like if it, oh, if, it, if yeah. something comes up and the and a, yeah, can you walk us through the little bit of the details on that? Oh yeah, sure. So uh, let's say a pacemaker or defibrillator, for example, um, patient had a shock and life is saved, but they go to the ER just to get checked. Uh, nobody knows how to check the device, so I would drive to let's say I'm in Tampa, so I would drive to let's say Sarasota, hour and a half drive, get there make sure everything's working right, the patient is okay, retrieve all the data for the uh, electrophysiologist, put it in the chart, and I'm done. So the physician later that day will come and review it to make sure everything that he needed to be done on this patient from a device perspective is already completed. So, and we do that for every single patient, even if it's a false alarm. So if patient goes to the ER for some other reason and they think we need to check it, we'll go there and check that patient. Got it. Got and that's why, that's why our industry, especially our industry, the cost of uh, device is high, but also the service burden is extremely high. Oh, 100%. And so, um, you know, I just want, I'm going to sort of read through like your, your go to market business model. So you, you mentioned um, Texas, focusing on, on Texas and Florida, maybe because they're high, high volume regions. Uh, yep. I would say, even more so today, just because there's, I think Florida, Florida has an issue. They have so many people moving there that like, I don't know if their infrastructure can even support it. Um, so, I mean, that's good for news for you guys. You, you mentioned that you expect to generate about $5.5 .5 million within, within two years of launch. And you mentioned with the units, the, the, the product itself. So again, each one retails for $5,300, uh, with an established reimbursement of $7,400. Does that mean that, um, uh, your total, your total cost, not cost, I'm sorry. So total, you'd be making 12700 12, every time each one is implanted. Is that correct? Yeah. No, the hospital makes that money. So we sell okay. to the hospital for 5300 and the hospital gets a reimbursement for that for 7600 So hospital makes got that it. money. Got it. So so, 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 so just to understand, yeah, so it's, okay, got it. So, so future Cardi will be making about $5,300 per, per unit, correct? We'll, we'll generate that as a gross revenue and minus the cost of goods and cost of delivery. So the commission is going to be huge um, for the uh, sales reps and our operation costs. So our margin on $5,000 unit is about 60 to 70%. And that is the norm for our industry. You said 60 to 70%? Mm -hmm. That's still, yes. those are still really good margins. It's a lot higher than I was expecting. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's going to get even lower when we... Uh, um, start the um, uh, automation, automation of some of our components. 
So, yeah, and so you mentioned with that current business model that you're projecting that your first 5,000 implants, it's going to generate about 26 million in revenue within four years. So yeah. my, my question to you is that for that to happen, you, you obviously need like some solid early adopters, uh, clinic, like clinical early adopters who are going to recommend and, and drive the proliferation of these devices. So right now, what is your, uh, what does your roster look like in terms of early adopters in both Texas and Florida? Yeah, so very strong. Uh, we have uh, physicians that are in need of these type of solution for their heart failure patients. So if you, you know, if, if you have a group of heart failure patients that are not being served by current solution, you know, the wearables or the cardio mems, then we have this huge gap that we can fill. So, and also we have uh, pacer reps that are not, they're ready to move on um, from their big companies. Uh, a lot of these pace reps are 20, 30 year veterans. They give everything for the company and the physicians and the patients, and they're not being appreciated. And I think this is a common theme among what I said earlier about manufacturing. It's the same problem with the uh, sales reps. I think the uh, sales reps should make far more than the CEOs uh, because they are the ones that are bringing the um, the product home, so and they're not being appreciated. So we we have about in past two months, I got about fifty calls from these type of sales reps saying, "When are you starting?" So I got that group already set, and then the physicians that are stuck between, what do I do with this page with this patient population that is not being served, and I don't want to do this crazy procedure for a monitoring solution, they're, they're perfectly fine with doing tough procedures to solve a uh, you know, problem. But for monitoring, it's just not a, something they are willing to venture out. So br bringing them a simple solution, uh, I think we have an op opportunity there. Fantastic. And again, like if you can just kind of address it one more time, you know, if you're dealing with a clinician and they're their pushback to you is just say, you know, why don't I just use what Medtronic and Boston Scientific has, right? What What is your number one, uh, I guess, uh, response to that? Absolutely. I, I have no intention of uh, taking 100% away from what they have. My, my question to the physician is, will this device bring value to you and your patient? If they say no, that was a perfect answer. And I said, thank you very much. And I'll leave and leave you alone. But if you think I can bring value to you and your patients, this is it. And if you think it's too big for you and your patients, I'm not that guy. Uh, and I'll be happy to walk out of that office. But I, what I can bring to them is I can save you time and it will be zero compromise to the patients and will bring a superior product that will bring value to you and your patients. And if you don't see that way, then... then your, and your main, your, main, your main thing, what's been the number one reason why uh, cardiologists are adopting your product? There has to be a common theme here. What's what's the number one reason why? Oh no, they're they're adopting it because um, um, these but, type but of why? devices. Like, what's what's the number one reason you would say? Like, what do they see? They're not adopting, or they're adopting. Oh, that they are adopting. Yeah, like if they say oh, this oh, is oh. the reason why I'm adopting. What, what what would that be? Is it better sensors? Better? What well, what would it be? Uh, for my device, would be better sensor, better connectivity. So those are two things I can definitely bring to the uh, uh, competitive space. Uh, size, we will lose that for sure. Um, another thing is the service. So we're going to leverage these pacer reps that's been in the field for 20, 30, 40 years, and we're going to leverage that expertise and bring that service back to physician. You know, it's interesting that you say that, Jay, because like, I think well, this is what I tell uh, sales reps all the time is that like uh, a lot of times, especially if you're a rep at a large company, I actually this week I did a uh, one of the episodes, I, every Friday I do a solo pod. So the reps vote what topic they want to hear. And so this past week, I think uh, 11 or 1200 reps voted and they voted like 70% to cover how to convert a bad territory. And one of the things I talk about in that is that like as a rep, you're not going to be able to change your company's uh, service policies. You're not going to be able to change the product and everything. But you have control of as a rep is like how you service the account. You know, and I guess in the in the restaurant industry, that would be the hospitality, right? And even um, I've spoken to, there's a pain management physician really well known. And she was telling me, she was like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Boston scientific gal, you know? And I was like, why is that? She's like, 
honestly, she's like Medtronic and other, they have good, good technology, but Boston scientific reps, they just have much better quality service. I can rely on them and everything. And so I think that this side is like, it can be this sort of uh, competitive advantage. I think a lot of companies don't think about, which is how well are we making sure that our reps focus on customer service? Do you feel like that's like a kind of a killer feature for you guys? Yeah, absolutely. That that will be a, one that will determine our ability to um, uh, uh, proliferate the service. And, and going back to that service burden. So imagine you're a big corporate and it's costing the, you money to service these physicians. And that's why you want to keep cutting their salaries and cutting the, the benefits, your, your team. And of course, the team's getting the quality of that service is going down because you're making less money for more work. It's dipped the other way on, on my philosophy. The, the reps will make a lot more money than any of us. And they, and they should because they're the ones that are driving the revenue. And any company where the reps make less than the CEO, it's not going to do well. You know, it's funny you say that because like it's like for me, I think it's like a very simple equation. It's like, okay, you want you want to re re recruit and retain top talent, pay more money. It's like very simple. It's very, very simple. You know, like very a lot of companies talk about this like, oh, our, our mission and everything. It's like, yeah, that's all great. Pay people more money. Pay people more money. You get better quality work. And it's funny because that like, you know, I think per, like if you look back, I always – one of my favorite uh, companies to profile is like Intuitive in the early 2000s, right? It was hyper-competitive. But why? Like, you know, and it was a brutal, brutal culture, right? Very disciplined. But guess what? They paid. They made really, really good money. And so the, the, the people who were the best were recruited there and only the best stuck around because if you weren't good enough for how much they were paying and how well people were doing, you just get rid of them and get the next yep. person. You know? Yep. Absolutely. And same thing with the Abiomed. It's just, you know, brutal sales environment, but it got paid very well. And the the service, you know, you provide the service to the patients and the physician, you know. And the same thing in pacemakers and defibrillators. You know, I remember carrying two pagers and two phones, getting a call at 2 a.m., checking a patient. It's like, yeah, we could wait until 7 a.m., but I went there and got it done. And that little thing made a difference. And, and you know, you're checking patients at the office and one patient comes in and it's a different device. You know, you, you go out of your way to help that patient out. And that, you know, not only helps the patient, but helps the physician and eventually it helps us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Jay, just to kind of like wrap things up, you know, uh, you're, you're currently, uh, you're, you're, are you full, fully commercial yet, or when, when do you expect your commercial launch? Yeah, so we're going to implant inpatient later this year uh, in Europe, and then we'll file for 510k clearance probably uh, early next year and hope to get the uh, earn the 510k clearance by end of next year, and then we can commercialize in U.S. Perfect. So long-term out, out, uh, outlook in terms of, let's say, like five or ten years from now, what does future cardio look like? I mean, are you are you trying to prove a model out and uh, attract like a strategic? Are you thinking about IPO? I mean, what if if I was a you know if we had a magic wand here and you said okay this is the you know the results in terms of the data the the adoption et cetera, Like what 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 would you want to happen? Yeah, so all all of them all of them are our option um, because we have the unique advantage. Uh, I would say we have the. Uh, uh, exclusivity of uh, class three devices like pacemakers and defibrillators, right? We got the uh, high value to the patients, clinicians, uh, and investors. And also it's a limited players. It's only Medtronic Boston. And we are in this ECG heart sound space, uh, and premium pricing. So it's not like some catheters and gadgets where you, you're trying to fight with 500 other companies and keep prices keep getting lower. So we got the premium pricing, high value to patients and physicians and, and limited players. So we got that going. So if, if the uh, opportunity for IPO or acquisitions come, absolutely we'll look into that, but we're not tied to it. So, cause we have a revenue, right? So if the, the numbers don't look good, then we can always say, well, we'll continue to work hard, bring the value to everybody that needs, you know, patients and physicians, and we'll increase our value. So, 
uh, like what Abumet did. So Abumet had multiple opportunity to sell the past five years or 10 years, but they kept, you know, focus on what they can do. And the valuation went to, you know, that $16 billion. So that's an option. Um, and, and we, I would like to follow that model as, as much as I can. And same thing with the sales model. No different than what Biotronic did with their business uh, and what Edwards Life Science did early on with a, a tavern. You know, they, they basically got all these independent stent reps and they got into a, a tavern business and that's how they grew their business. So uh, my philosophy and approach is very similar to what this aggressive, uh, conscientious uh, startups did early on. Got it. Got it. And that makes a lot of sense. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to... Uh sort of watch watch you guys grow and see what you guys do and you know thanks for reaching out it's an, a very interesting product uh and and more importantly i think what i gets me excited is that you know provides a solution that's going to be uh valuable for both patients and clinicians and uh you know the, i think you might be the first founder to come on and talk about the value that the sales you know sales and clinical sales team is going to have um Absolutely. so i know that at least once you once you guys go commercial, let me know. Um, my Instagram handle, the uh, All Hail Medical Sales. We got about eight, almost eight thousand reps who follow it. So yeah. I'm sure a lot of them are going to be very interested to apply to your company. I um, love that. I love that. Yeah, no, thank totally. You. Well, Jay, thank you so much for joining. And then for the audience who is listening, if you want to learn more, uh, just look Jason up on uh, on on uh, on LinkedIn. It's J A E S O N Jason Bang, and you can check out Future Cardia at their website, futurecardia.com. And uh, Jay, I'll kind of let you, you know, any last words before we sign off? No, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it was a great conversation. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, in 20 years of uh, class three devices, I, I wanted to make something that would bring value to, you know, I keep saying patients and physicians, but the, you know, that's, I, I think that, you know, I, w I was always told, focus on the patients and the physicians and the money will come. And it's always been true. So uh, and also, I want to build a company that we bring value to the people that are using it and also the sales reps. And I want to be a sales driven, sales rep focused company um, that pay these guys that what they, they, you know, they will bring. Fantastic. I love it. I know my audience is going to love that. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for listening. This has been another episode of the State of MedTech. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the show. Forward this on to somebody who you know who will benefit from the episode. And hey, give us five stars and write a review. I'm Omar Khatib, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of the State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show, or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care. And we'll see you next time.